I'd intended to start this presentation with an audio example. It was going to be an extract from the last in-depth interview recorded with Sir Howard Morrison, which took place just a few years before his death. The reason I'd picked it was, when it came time to make his obituary piece for broadcast, we discovered that the raw interview master CDs and the edited master CDs had all degraded to a point where digital artifacts drowned out the interview. This seemed like a good departure point, so I tracked down the discs again. We couldn't bear to bin them and put them on one in my drive, and then another, and then another. And it turns out that the best I can do today is show you the disc. <laughs> I'm not kidding, people cried. Broadly speaking, I work as a content creator for Radio New Zealand. Specifically, my job is to produce recordings of classical music and occasionally make feature programs. But basically, my colleagues and I create content for broadcast and the web. And we're good at it. We're really passionate about giving the New Zealand public high quality radio, and we pull out all the stops to achieve that. Along with going to great lengths to record new audio, we draw on material from sources like Sound Archives Na Tonga Korero, and we lodge some historically significant recordings with them and other archival organisations too. The thing is, though, that our in house collections exist in a variety of forms, on a variety of storage media, catalogued in a variety of ways, in a variety of databases. Each silo has built up over many years and been through incarnations of its own. Some systems, such as those in our newsroom, have a developed level of maturity to the process, while others are still highly manual. Today I've been asked to talk about what challenges Radio New Zealand's networks have faced in preserving their audio collections. I think there are themes here that will apply to any number of organisations that focus on content creation, and details that are widely applicable to others too. So I'll explore various aspects of where we're up to at Radio New Zealand, how we got there, and where we're headed next. A question which has become a big issue for our music, drama and features departments in recent years is what exactly should we keep? Click. Nothing happening. There we go. Um, what exactly should we keep? The news department solved this some years ago by capturing every individual story that makes it to broadcast using their server-based systems. It works well for them, but the audio quality wasn't deemed high enough for preserving music, drama, or features. So another tangential system was added. In the days of reel-to-reel, -reel, a program was recorded to tape possibly spliced or dub edited to create a master, then the program was broadcast and tapes were either archived or reused. In the early days of computer editing, each producer had a portable hard drive, which limited the amount of raw material they could keep. So once CD masters were generated, it was imperative that old projects be removed so that the next project could start. With the advent of server storage, staff were advised that they should be careful not to accumulate too much old project material, but all that space made life too easy. Positive spin-offs were found. For example, projects could be kept and more easily worked for, say, summer, release, uh, summer programming, and music recordings could be remastered for commercial releases. I myself have to confess that my storage consumption went up from 16 gigs to just over a terabyte before the decision was made that guidelines had to be replaced by policy. And for today's purposes, I'll call that challenge number one. By this stage, we'd developed workflows to publication that made settling on a policy less than straightforward. The thing is that it's not unusual for some programs to coexist in a short edit and a long edit, both of which could easily co include copyrighted content that limits future, u future use, such as music in the background of a radio drama. So then, doesn't it make sense to also keep unedited, unmixed audio, which could still be used where copyright is an issue? Or simply where it's historically significant recording and we can't necessarily anticipate what will be useful in the future? And while our concerts are mastered to stereo with a reduced dynamic range for broadcast on FM, a number of them exist in a format that could be remastered to um, surround sound with full dynamic range for future publication. Isn't that worth keeping? The possibilities and permutations go on. The question we have to ask ourselves first are what are the reasons for keeping this stuff? I've mentioned a few of them already, the primary argument being reuse on air, either excerpted into new programming or the rebroadcast of whole programs. 
We have a history of using material in this way, and that need isn't going to disappear. All delivery formats are in a state of change. Sorry. Also, <laughs> delivery formats are in a state of change. The way we choose to retain this content could influence our ability to take full advantage of, say, future developments in online delivery or digital audio broadcasting. The policy we've set out is, I think, very practical. We keep the most complete masters of all programs at the same audio quality that they were created, and permission can be granted for raw audio or wide dynamic range pre-masters to be kept where, for example, historical significance suggests we should. For instance, a late career interview with a um, major New Zealand artist, such as Sir Howard Morrison. The policy also indicates the audio should be kept on replicated servers and managed in, with an integrated database system. There are, of course, implications from this. The creation of a policy gave the company a cornerstone on which to build a new approach to preservation, but it set standards that we weren't yet equipped to meet. I started with a bad news story about losing Sir Howard's last interview, but there's good news too. If the clicker works, there we go. In the form of a push towards the light at the end of the tunnel. Earlier this year, money was approved for a short-term one-off preservation project. It couldn't attract much in the way of future depreciation, so capital expenditure had to be a relatively small component. And the deadline for the spending was the end of the financial year. The timing was perfect, if somewhat restricted and it's enabled the company to address major implications that our new policy has presented. I'll go into more detail later on, but this allows us to view the rest of the challenges I talk about in an encouraging light. Challenge number two is the integration of our various collections. At the moment, if I wanted to source audio on a particular topic, it's possible that I'd have to query several databases which store their metadata in different ways, and some of which I don't have direct access to. That's not to say that the databases themselves aren't good. Each one allows us to identify and track down an individual program out of the thousands we have stored. The trick is knowing who to ask and where to start. The solution to this comes in two parallel strands, amalgamation of existing data records onto an integrated system and the integration of standardized preservation workflow into the creation publication workflow. Clearly this presents a technical challenge but with the right people on the development team, consulting the right people from the group of end users with the appropriate budget allocated, it's not just possible, it's happening as I speak. Needless to say, time is tight and money isn't bulging in our pockets. We're a publicly funded, non-profit mating, public service after all. But I believe that the right vision is in place. Also, workflows and integration Altering workflows and in integrating systems presents a cultural challenge too, which mustn't be underestimated. Some people might say, just tell them that's the way they have to do it from now on, but that's not how a passion for content works. If the workflows are restrictive or generate too much extra work without greater than equal payback, then passion goes down, quality goes down, and the point of preservation looks shaky. Radio New Zealand isn't a company with a short-term work workforce. I've been there for 11 years now, and I stopped feeling like a ch spring chicken only recently. I've attended 40th anniversaries where multiple staff have been recognised on the same day. People who are that invested in their work, who are still genuinely passionate about what they do, will be invested in their processes too. The benefits of change will be enormous, so it shouldn't be a hard sell, and the systems will reflect the way staff already exist with some on systems online, so the concepts won't be foreign. The challenge here will be to ensure that the new systems genuinely answer the needs of our experienced workforce. Our third major challenge is dealing with audio formats that we've inherited. In recent years, our recordings of music by New Zealand classical composers have been transferred to network storage, and in terms of protecting a culturally significant collection, it was a great step forward. But it's a drop in the ocean compared to the material left behind. There are still people who know how to thread a reel-to-reel, -reel, but it's not second nature anymore, and the media itself definitely needs careful treatment. There are still a few players around, but compared to the number of tapes we own, a major dubbing project isn't exactly on the cards. Quality DAT players are a scarcity too. Manufacture stopped in around 2005, and spare parts have pretty much dried up. Some people at Radio New Zealand clearly had their thinking caps on when we bought almost the last units ever sold. 
We've got a couple on standby that are still practically as fresh as the day they were made so that when the time comes to recover our remaining debts, we'll still have something good to play them with. Now, something that might come as a bit of a surprise to you is that even professional broadcast quality CD players are a scarcity. You can buy players that are okay for DJs, you can buy players that are okay for pubs, and you can pay eye-watering amounts for glamorous players um, suitable for audiophiles, but the options for broadcast or preservation are quality pretty thin, really. Parallel to the dwindling supply of playback units is the fading quality of the media that we're storing our audio on. Above all else, this is the ticking time bomb which should force us and other organisations like us to push ahead with the preservation of our collections. I'll shift here from talking concepts and workflows to talking details, because they illustrate the complexity of the problem and teach caution for the use of future media too. Some of it is a source of huge frustration, but it's interesting. The history of audio formats is far from simple. Even if you ignore the early days and drop in in the 1950s when professional engineers began utilising a variety of open reel tape formats, a range of associated recording and or with a, <laughs> with a range of associated recording standards. The tapes were analogue and the audio was stored in an iron oxide layer glued to a cellulose acetate tape, commonly a quarter inch wide, although other physical sizes were used too. These persisted through to the late 80s and into the 90s. Tape was expensive. If you talk to people who were at Radio NZ in the 90s, they'll tell you that no one was allowed to cut tape. The engineers became experts at dub edits, allowing tapes to be, re be reused. So economic constraints affected audio preservation from that area. E era. Material we'd keep today, as a matter of course, was fair game to be recorded over to make the next edition. It wasn't a lack of foresight at the company, they simply had no choice. Then along came digital recording. The company's Bedford vans with reinforced axles could finally be ditched, since the ton of recording equipment required to put an orchestra or string quartet on tape had been replaced with a smallish box that weighed just a few kilos. Looking through the shelves in our collections from this era, you'll encounter, in amongst DAT tapes, the occasional SVHS tape, a format that we experimented with where digital audio was recorded to a videotape. A fun spin-off from this is that you can actually play the tape in a video player and see the data. Black and white dots whizzing past. Kind of like an early incarnation of the iTunes visualizer, except that in this case you have to choose a picture or sound, not both at the same time. DAT won the format war in these early stages of digital audio, no doubt because of the diminutive size of the tapes. Recorders could be highly compact, and suddenly field recordings became a breeze with units like the Tascam DAP-1. It didn't take long, though, for some concerns to be expressed about the longevity of the format's data retention. At an Audio Engineering Society panel discussion in 1995, recording and preservation professionals all agreed in no uncertain terms that they didn't believe DAT was an archiving solution. I started at Radio NZ in 2001 and was soon handling tapes which were audibly degraded only a few years after having been recorded. Certainly there had been the occasional issue with, with reel to reel where oxide had started to shed, but even today most reels that do, that do remain in our collection are capable of delivering their content if treated with care. After that came CDR. Manufacturers boldly predicted a 100 year lifespan at least. In 2004, I'm glad you're laughing, in 2004, verbatim and dimation were quoted in the UK's independent newspaper as saying that users could reasonably expect 100 years and even 200 years from their products. Mitsui Advanced Media indicate today that 300 years isn't outside the realm of possibility, so long as media has kept it ambient temperatures. Now, uh, Imation defines ambient temperatures as 18 degrees Celsius and 40% humidity. In other words, colder than the recommended office temperatures and really at the lower end of comfortable humidity. Certainly, in all accelerated aging tests that I've read about, products using Mitsui's technology have outperformed all competitors. Though bold assertions from independent testing authorities along the lines of 100, 200 or 300 years have eluded me so far. A paper published in 2007 by the Library of Congress in conjunction with the National Institute of Standards and Technology presented their assessment of archival quality CD lifespan based on some accelerated aging tests. 
They predicted with 95% confidence that tw at 25 degrees Celsius and 50% humidity, five of the seven brands tested would have a 5% failure rate within 45 years. And every disc made by the remaining two brands would contain unrecoverable errors by the 45 year mark. The results were presented the other way around in the same that, way that biscuits might say 95% fat free, but my glass is half empty on that issue. Radio NZ's broadcast networks ran with Mitsui Gold Archive discs as their brand of choice, based on the information available in the early 2000s, and selected Plex store drives for burning the data, based on their strong reputation. However, as I've emphasized already, our collections are the byproduct of creation for broadcast, not preservation for archive. Discs aren't handled with cloth gloves and left in a cool, dry, dark room. They're handled as needed and stored, in, uh, stored conveniently for reuse. I suspect our use of media falls somewhere between ideal conditions and the con conditions in accelerated aging. Nowhere in the literature is there discussion of how media will fare under these conditions, but anecdotal evidence suggests that a little bit of use results in greater than anticipated degradation. Unfortunately, the need to clearly label a disc for fast identification in the studio led to the decision to use stick-on printable CD labels on a lot of the discs. After all, it's all very well to have thousands of discs neatly stacked in drawers with minimal markings on them, but if you get the discs mixed up in the studio or on someone's desk, they're as good as lost. This decision seems to have, a, had, seems to have had a catastrophic effect on our collections. If a label was applied with the utmost care, then a reasonable seal could be created and damage to the disc seems to be slower than if the application process was less thorough. If oxygen could easily get through the gaps in the glued surface of the disc, it accelerates the deterioration of the media. With all this in mind, I recently went to the Nito website to look at their label products. If you were to do the same, you would see that they sell a range for use on CDs and DVDs, and they guarantee them. Track down the guarantee, and you'll notice that even though it applies to a product directly marketed for use on CDs and DVDs, the wording carefully details that use on DVD is safe, but only mentions CDs when discussing storage temperature and humidity. Is that cheeky? Well, yes, I think so, because unless you know that CD and DVD are physically very different, it's easy to extrapolate guidance on DVD labeling as being the same for CD. For those of you who don't know, Recordable DVDs have a dye layer and a delicate reflective layer that's buried through the center of the disc, well out of harm's way. CDRs, on the other hand, are manufactured with the reflective surface practically exposed on the top of the media with the dye layer directly beneath that. Turns out that putting, a glued paper, putting glued paper on a delicate surface that's critical to the operation of a piece of media is terrible for the longevity of that media. Forget temperature and humidity, once the glue has made way for the oxygen to quickly get down into the metal, your data will cease to be at a rate of knots. Put it this way, I would expect to find some non-recoverable errors in any recordable CD that I pick up which was burnt before 2005, with or without a label, though labelled stock will be worse. Go back to discs from 2003, and I'd expect to find error rates in orders of magnitude worse still, rendering the audio on many of these discs unrecoverable without arduous work. To put that in context, the DATs which were causing so much concern in 2001 don't appear to have got much worse, and in my experience, are actually in better shape than the CDs that replaced them. Was that predictable? Well, in response to criticism regarding the life of CDR, Imation's customer relations team recommended purchasing a few units of a product and testing them, which is of course very useful advice when you're talking about effects that will come, take some years to become apparent. Highlight is, uh, sorry, hindsight is an easy, used, easy tool to criticize with. Within the context of all the hype about how incredible gold master media was, it seems to me that vast numbers of consumers would make the same mistake again. Today, looking at, um, on the shelves of you, uh, your nearest stationery shop, you'll find CD labels being pushed, like tobacco for your discs. It's all very frustrating, but with rapidly fa failing media as a given, our challenge is to preserve what we can. So, in tandem with the project to build an integrated database and preservation management system, we're also making a concerted effort to centralize content from our CD media onto servers. 
Remember the project I mentioned earlier, which has to be completed by June 30th? In a one-off mad dash, we have a system in place to rip as much as, com as, as is recoverable from our content. <laughs> in a one-off mad dash, we have a system in place to rip as much as is recoverable from our compact disc collection in a 12-week period. I'm estimating that we'll have to run at an average of around 130 discs an hour. After comparing what could be achieved with a CD jukebox star machine versus a room full of humans and PCs, we came to the unexpected collection that people were the best option. So my life currently revolves around setting up processes that will allow shifts of 10 people to operate four drives each with a combined total of 16 hours a day, which is a, um, as much error checking as possible, and backup processes to ensure reliable linking of audio to database records once the database is completed. The audio will end up on replicated server storage in our Auckland and Wellington offices, which will provide both wider access to the collections and strengthen the company's disaster recovery options too. I could probably talk about this project for hours, but that's the core of it. So come the end of, uh, of July 2012, our collections will be much closer to technical maturity, but we'll have to implement workflows that serve preservation. That goes in hand with another challenge, which represents the logical step after a company-wide server-based collection management system is in place, and that's a company-wide server-based broadcasting system. As I've briefly mentioned, Radio NZ does have a server-based broadcast system, but while it certainly achieves what news and talk-based programs require, its MP2 compression standard doesn't deal as well one, as one might hope with material where sound quality is critical. So multiple broadcast workflows and platforms are still used. As a next step, if we can at least integrate all music, drama and features programming into a system which standardises broadcast workflows, then that can feed into, into an integrated preservation system for those departments that runs in parallel with news. One day, we'll hopefully have access to a broadcast and preservation system which can serve all departments' needs. At, the, at that point, we'll be able to regard all systems as having full maturity. In the meantime, we're on our way, and the future of Radio New Zealand's creation, publication, preservation and retrieval systems looks very promising indeed. Thank you.